if you then stop thinking about it, it won't impact your behavior. But if you keep thinking about it, after nine weeks, it's changed your behavior. It's impacting how you think, how you feel, and how you choose in your behaviors, your emo your cognition, your intellectual, etc., on every level. But if it hasn't had nine weeks of attention, it will just kind of get stuck in your non-conscious mind. So any one day during the day, we think, feel, choose and build. And then at nighttime, we sort out what we built. We wired for survival. Our brain is wired for love and our mind is wired for optimism. So it's to step back one step. You, you wire, you store me, these thoughts in your brain, in these trees made of proteins on the neurons. Those are called dendrites. You also store the same memory in your mind. So it's in, quite an, in a quantum field. And um, physicists have won Nobel Prizes talking about this quantum field. So it's not some woo-woo thing. It's actual science. And then the third place we store everything is in our body. So we made of, as I mentioned earlier, 37 to 100 trillion cells collectively in our brain and our body. So the memory that you're forming when you woke up this morning, the me first memory that you formed in response to maybe the email that you read on your phone, I'm just giving you something, just take some, let's say you, you reach, you open your eyes, you reach for your phone and you read an email and you respond. And that is stimulation. You think, feel, choose, you've built either healthy or toxic thought into your brain, into your mind, second place, and in every cell of your body. So that was a horrible horrible email, you would have built a toxic response in your brain, in your mind, and in your body. And this is why in PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, we shouldn't call it disorder. We should call it a reordering of the brain. As you experience something, you neuroplastically re reorder the brain for survival. And as I mentioned earlier, sometimes it's, 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 it's not the best sustainable response, but in that moment, it's all you could do. The, the thing is that the, all you could do is maybe is in the long run may not be sustainable and becomes that negative pattern that impacts relationships and whatever, all the things down the line. Okay, so that during the at night, you sort out what you've built during the day. So that's why we have dreams and nightmares because we're trying to get rid of this. A nightmare is basically trying to get rid of this that we haven't dealt with. So anything undealt with will manifest in our dreams and nightmares. It will manifest physically in our body and it will manifest physically, obviously, in our brain and manifest in our mind. So we've got three places we experience things. And that's why it's so hard to deal with hard stuff, to deal with toxic traumas and toxic habits, big, small, little, acute, long-term, short-term, one-off, bad habits, bad responses, um, patterns you've maybe got into in a marriage or a relationship where you um, where you make assumptions and you keep living in those same patterns. It's all very physically felt because you can't separate mind and brain and body. If I get into an argument with, with someone who I've argued with before and I perceive them in a certain way, as soon as they trigger me, this is going to come up and that's how I'm going to respond. But my whole body's going to respond and my brain and my mind. So I'm going to feel the heart palpitations. I'm going to feel sick in my gut or whatever the case may be. So there's an absolute link. And I show this in my most recent clinical trials, which is in the book about how when we had our control and an experimental group and First of all, we put them, I took them over the 63 days because that's, I also was doing research on how long it takes to form a habit because everyone's, there's very little research out there confirm on showing how long it takes to form a habit. Everyone just goes on about habits, but no one's really done very good research on it. There's a, only a couple of other scientists and myself that have actually now shown my most recent clinical trials, most up-to-date research showing that it takes 63 days at least to form a habit. Okay. So essentially, and I lost my train of thought there for a moment. Okay, so I was telling you about how we, when when we experience something, um, okay, Jay, uh, let me stop there for a moment. Let's, I don't, I don't want to go off track. I'm saying so much stuff. Do you, should we just regroup a little bit before I go into explaining the next whole phase? Do you want to do, you want to do that? Do you want to ask let's, me? Let's do that. Let's, um, one question that I was very yeah. curious about when you mentioned dreams there, um, this might be a weird question to ask. <laughs> I'm going to ask it anyway. Have you done any, any research or any study on when males have what we call wet dreams at all and why do we have them? 
I don't, they haven't done direct research on that, but it just shows once again, the integration between mind and body. So whatever we're experiencing during the day is built into our brains. And then at nighttime, we're sorting out our thinking. So, and our body is responding. So whatever we're dealing with in our brain, and, and that happens a lot when a, a, a young a, a young guy's going through hormonal changes, it's a very, very natural response to, because we are very sexual beings. We think about sex up to 95% of the day, male and female, because it's a beautiful, beautiful thing it's a it's not just a physical thing it is a survival thing it's a connection thing it's a beautiful thing there's just so much around the whole concept of sex that we should talk more about that it's very normal for a young um, young girl and a young guy with when their bodies hormones are changing and that kind of thing and they're trying to deal with all of that for them to be processing it in their dreams and so there is that because you, your, your dream is sorting out these thoughts and these thoughts are in your brain and your body so you because remember, thoughts are spilt in three places. So whatever you thinking about in your dreams, you will experience in your bodies. And that's why people, when they have nightmares, for example, they'll wake up and feel like their heart's being crushed. They feel sick physically because your whole body is, is experiencing that housekeeping function to try and sort out this mess and that's why it's so important that we get proactive in mind management because we can then be more in control of our dreams and our nightmares mm. so to to come back to your question about the integration between mind and body and trauma you which were the other two questions which which is the third question ties into that with the with the, the wet dreams and so on um is that that yes without a doubt they integrated and when i did my research I just, and I did a lot with trauma people. So I'll, I'm going to answer your trauma question. I haven't forgotten the trauma question. I'm going to get back to that. I just wanted to lay the foundation. Essentially, when we took our control group and experimental group, the experimental group got mind management. They got the five-step neurocycle process that we're going to be talking about. The control group didn't. But both groups went through extensive testing. And the testing that they went through was we did standard psychological testing. Then I've developed a psychological test that within that can literally read your unconscious mind and how you're self-regulating and is linked to how your cortisol and homocysteine in your body and your HPA axis significant correlation. So when you when you fill in that scale, we can we can see from that scale and predict from that scale how self-regulated, how mind managed you are, how you're managing your stress and just life in general. Then we also did the person's narrative. And I'm stressing all of this because the narrative Narrative is the most important component of anyone story. It's the narrative that it's the narrative has been kicked out of current mental health practices because people have mental health has been put on the same level as the biomedical model. So people, you have people we told, okay, you've got cancer. That's the diagnosis. That's the treatment. You've got diabetes. That's the diagnosis. That's the treatment. You've got heart disease. That's the diagnosis. That, so they're trying to say you've got depression. That's the diagnosis. That's the treatment. You've got anxiety, but it's not because it works for the, for, it works for the biological component. It works for brain and body but it doesn't work for mind so if, if we take your narrative and we and we forget all about what you went through as a six-year-old and your progression of your life and what you've gone through as an adult and where you are now that is massive that is no one has got that story no one sees life like you there's something you can do that no one else can do if i don't bring that into the picture which is mine which is you if i if i exclude that and just say oh you are clinically depressed i have missed the point completely and I've put you in a very dangerous position.